Hey and welcome, Hammy here and today we'll be rounding up some interesting Overwatch lore, storytelling and world building news from the last few days that may have slipped under your radar. A lot of Overwatch lore and game interesting facts, background about the game's development and more have been shared recently by both Michael Chu and Jeff Kaplan in some conferences they've been presenting at. Here we'll delve into what they discussed, what it might mean for Overwatch and the story, the interesting things they brought up about the game's development and background, and the light it shines on both Overwatch's game development philosophies and story. I'll also cover a bit of Overwatch news at the end. Bit of a new video format, do let me know your thoughts in the comments and there are time codes in the description to skip. Firstly, let's round up the news from conferences. Now, Mr. Chu spoke at the Game Developers Conference, or GDC, over the last few days, presenting Thinking Globally, Building the Optimistic Future of Overwatch. Jeff Kaplan gave the keynote at the Design, Innovate, Communicate and Entertain. That was called How Overwatch Created a Hopeful Vision of the Future, so some similar themes there. In both of these talks, we got some nice background and insight into the world and story design process behind Overwatch, as well as the game's history. For context, these presentations were at games industry events, they're not closed, it's known full well that people will discuss them outside of that circle. Jeff's Dice presentation is available on YouTube, I'll put the link in the description and at the end of this video, and Michael Chu's is locked behind a paywall on the GDC website. As a result, just to be careful, everything that I state from Mr. Chu's talk has to be taken as not 100% gospel fact, as I'm building it from secondary sources. There's no video of his talk available, but I've cross-checked everything with a few sources, including people who were there, and given those sources in the comments below. Okay. Okay, let's get into the GC background. Firstly for Michael Chu's talk. He did say at the start of this talk that any date or timeline stuff discussed might be incorrect, so don't consider any of it in stone if it comes up later. So caveat emptor for you there. The first thing that I thought was really interesting was Michael Chu talking about hero story, their creation process, and how their character can be drawn from their abilities, as it were, in the gameplay. The first thing mentioned was how the slightly contradictory depiction of Ana in the image of the Overwatch team receiving medals was a little bit of a mistake. And this has actually already been talked about by Mr. Chu on the Overwatch forums. The reason for this, apparently, was that the team did not yet have an old Ana design when that image was done and when the trailer was made in which it featured, the Winston Are You With Us Overwatch cinematic trailer. As a result, Ana's status and timeline hadn't been fully established by that point either. It has since been clarified that Morrison, Reyes and Ana all should look a bit older in this image. Another thing that she mentioned, apparently, was that all of Ana's story, besides that that was teased pre-launch, like her occasional depictions, the voice line reference from Soldier 76, it was actually all created later in development, and Chu specifically discussed the story team creating her story based on how she would fit into the timeline. In particular, her conflict with Widowmaker was part of this second stage. So you can actually see from this that story development actually can come quite a lot later in the development of a hero rather than being the thing that it's built on to start with. And this was actually supported in other ways when Chu discussed a bit more about heroes can develop their story and character through the way in which they're designed as an actual hero. On the official forums not too long ago, Chu mentioned an answer to a question as to how heroes were conceived. They can come apparently from many different places all over the team, but they're mostly from one of three places, either art, design, or story as a basis, or some combination of the above. Three different ones were mentioned. There was one which was introducing a character to fill a specific gameplay space, like an indirect fire character to go against turrets or Bastion, which was Junkrat's purpose. They also wanted a flying rocket launcher using character, so there you go, Farah, or Rocket Queen as she was known in development, or when they wanted to introduce a sniper support character. Other times, characters have actually come rather than designed from an art space. Zarya and Winston were cited as being really strong art designs that were dreamed up visually that then needed stories and abilities fitting to them. Finally, there are characters that apparently come out of the story, like Soldier 76. The team wanted to have a character who could shine a light on lots of different parts of the narrative. In his case, Soldier 76, of course, and Jack Morrison are basically at the spine of the entire history of Overwatch as a game. The timeline, the existence of the organization, the Omnic Crisis, everything that's happened afterwards can be told through Soldier 76 if required. Interestingly, Chu then also went on to talk about how some characters' attributes and story and their personalities can be derived from their mechanics. Reinhardt was cited as an example. The shield ability, for example, implies that he's a protector of others. Being a tank means that he wants people to hit him, hence his taunting in his voice lines. His charge ability kind of shows that Rein has an eagerness to fight and a little bit of a rashness or a brashness when it comes to getting into the fray. And Fire Strike and Earth Shatter, and I really hope this is a direct quote, meant that Rein, apparently, according to Chu, likes RPGs. Now, I love this because 
out of context, I can see Reinhardt playing RPGs. Of course, we see him as being a fan of D.Va, he wants her autograph in the game in his voice lines, and Reinhardt's voice actor, Darren DePaul, uh, you may recognise him as a Warcraft player as Blackhand, the voice of Blackhand from Warlords of Draenor, and he does several other voices, including Star Wars, The Old Republic, and a bunch more. He actually drops in on a lot of Geek and Sundry's gaming and tabletop RPG shows, including Critical Role, the D&D show that has Matt Mercer, who's the voice of McCree, running the game. Anyway, now, a major goal apparently in the design of every hero, according to Chu, is that every hero can be the hero of their own story, or every player can be the hero of their own game. As a result, characters need to have lots of characteristics that increase the chance that a player or person can connect with them. So, what would allow us to connect with a character like Doomfist? Even if there are evil guys, then we need to be able to connect with them in some way or another. Take Junkrat and Roadhog, for example. If you take a look at those two, and this was cited in the talk as well, Junkrat, he has grown up in the area of the Australian Omnium, and he doesn't remember the history beforehand. Roadhog in Mako Rutledge is a bit older, and he's seen the change of the Australian outback being destroyed when this Omnium went up, the Australian government giving the land almost as a reservation to the Omnics, and he was displaced from his home. So you've got two very different characters, is there. If you look at them as international criminals causing mayhem and destruction, possibly even killing people, they certainly are. But if you delve into their backstory more, you can find these elements that make them, if not good people, then certainly slightly more understandable, slightly more relatable. Perhaps Doomfist can have something more to his story than just being a generic bad guy or brute, and as a result maybe Reaper, when we have a think about his story, is not pure evil. There's something that's gone wrong there, and it's going to be interesting to find out what it is. A big thanks I want to say to a viewer who kindly wrote in for his thoughts on that, as well as a lot of his notes on this presentation. Chu also covered a few more random interesting points that I don't think come into a particular category, and I'll go through those now. Apparently, the rumour about Lucio originally being intended to be Canadian because of his hockey skin was debunked. Apparently Kaplan and a bunch of the other higher-ups just really like hockey. Chu also also described the terms Omnic and Robot as being interchangeable in the Overwatch world. Of course, Omnics are built by Omnica Corporation, and as a result, because when the Omniums churned out all of these robots during the first Omnic crisis, Omnic and Robot would have kind of become interchangeable. The one example that Michael Chu has cited before is you should think of Omnics and Robots, or Omnics and Mechs, as kind of being like Kleenex and tissues. Kleenex is a brand of tissue, and you could say, oh, can you pass me a Kleenex? But everyone knows that it's tissue paper. So the two are interchangeable in that sense. Kind of like Hoover and Vacuum Cleaner as well, I would say. Interestingly, there was this one particular slide where Chu was discussing Farah and the importance of family and various different relationships to her. And there was a reference of the image from Reflections. So who knows? There's lots of speculation as to whether that is Farah's family or not. Maybe this supports it, maybe it doesn't, but we'll have to wait and see. Chu also apparently mentioned that the intent was always for Farah's parents to be seen as a soldier and a public servant of another type. So if Anna is the soldier, then Farah's dad, public servant, someone in authority or something similar. A lot of people have speculated that before. It'll be interesting to see if, in time, maybe we find that out. There was also some digging into the Anna Origins image, which had some interesting lore clarifications and maybe interpretations. So the image of young Farah in Anna's Origins image with the Overwatch team, Mercy was described as being visiting from her university, rather than actually being part of the organisation yet. Timeline-wise, that makes perfect sense. A lot of people have mentioned this image as being a bit of a weird one, trying to work out how old Mercy was, how old McCree was, and similar. McCree was also mentioned as being freshly recruited into Blackwatch at this point. So again, that's all tying up. That's making a bit more sense than just the image on its own now. Now, interestingly and apparently, the image originally showed Torbjorn without and before his prosthetic eye and arm. The team actually had to specifically redo the image to swap the flesh for prosthetics. Here is the before image from the presentation. A big thanks to Inven. I'm using this under fair use, go check out their article link below. You can see the interesting before and after here. Finally, Chu referred to the two as of yet unnamed characters to either side of the image as unrelated, unimportant characters with a tone that was obviously very sarcastic. That's a lot of fun. Obviously it doesn't tell us anything about them, but I can't wait to discover who they are. The final thing, and I think this is interesting both in terms of our expectations for how Overwatch story will evolve, as well as maybe our questions that we have about the past, was that both Michael Chu and Jeff Kaplan in their talks talked about the story not being too pre-planned ahead of time and instead trying to cultivate it over time. And this was called flexible storytelling. As part of this, Chu pointed out Overwatch's use of unreliable narrators in the plural, referring mainly to Sombra as perhaps being an unreliable narrator, but also Soldier 76, interestingly. He implied that this had to do with the limited perspective the characters have of their worlds, colouring 
their perspectives on everything that we see. So interestingly, we can't even always trust everything right now that Soldier 76 says, a little bit obsessed being on this quest for revenge for discovering the truth behind the conspiracy that he sees perhaps. Sombra and Reaper, I think we can say that they're definitely not the most reliable of narrators anyway. The other reason for keeping the story flexible and open was so that other small episodes of story could be added within the bigger plot without getting too restricted. And there was so much flexibility as a result for this for Overwatch to develop its storyline since the game was released through the animated shorts and the comics. And Chu actually referred to a quote by George R. R. Martin, planting a seed and letting it grow. Martin's quote, to paraphrase, basically says that there are two kinds of writers, architects and gardeners. Architects plan everything ahead of time, know where everything's going to be, and have it all designed and blueprinted before it's even started. Gardeners dig a hole, drop in a seed and water it. They know what kind of seed it is and they know what they planted, but as it grows, they don't know exactly how it's going to look and they find out. And Martin described himself as more of a gardener than an architect. So, what does that mean for us? Well, for those of you who love a massively detailed universe, like me for example, I think this is a good example of where we have to have a little reality check. And remember that we're in year one of what hopefully is a 15 plus or more year journey. Like other Blizzard franchises and worlds, it's not going to all come out immediately, and particularly given Overwatch's somewhat troubled start before it became what it is today, in Project Titan of course, we have to remember that there was a quite a short period of time for all of this to come together in. That's okay. I mean, as much as we crave more story and we'd love it all as soon as we can have it, remember how long StarCraft and WarCraft have been around to develop their big worlds, massive universes, books, and everything else that comes around them. Now, quickly jumping onto Jeff's dice talk, that also backed up this theme. He actually said in his talk that the team felt that this world and these heroes no longer entirely belong to us and we're good with it. The team was cited as loving fan fiction, all of the art and cosplay, all of the ideas that people have about the characters. He referenced shipping and said that you can find out from the community they all have ideas as to what characters are doing in their private lives. And he actually specifically said that Blizzard see themselves as custodians of the universe. Community will create and suggest ideas and Blizzard can cooperate and work together almost with the community to sort of see how things move forward. So those ideas, when you put them together with the flex narrative and storytelling that Chu mentioned, you can see I think that Blizzard are trying to make a point about how they see the story developing and also perhaps giving us maybe a little nudge to let us know that it's early days as well and as much as we're ravenous for all of the detail some of it's going to come as we go along. Other cool things that Jeff mentioned, well he actually went a little bit more into the history of Overwatch and its birth from the sort of remains of Project Titan. I found this particularly interesting because he referred to May 2013 when Titan was sort of shuttered. It had 140 devs working on it with a lot of emotional investment. 80 of those devs were permanently relocated to other teams within Blizzard on the other games they had. 20 were sent as long-term loans to other projects, not coming back to the team anytime soon. From those, there were only 40 people left on the Titan team. They were given six weeks to make a new idea for a Blizzard game. If it was compelling enough, they could move it forward to a new project. If it wasn't compelling, the team would be broken up and sent to other Blizzard games. So that's a pretty tough situation. A game that you've been working for a long time on has been shuttered as almost a failure, and the remaining team was faced with quite a lot of despair, a bit of a dark situation, not knowing where they were going to be going next. So to try and pull themselves out of this, Jeff mentioned that they were kind of thinking of a bright and hopeful world, and of those six weeks the team had, they spent two weeks of it trying to make an MMO or get an idea for an MMO of an existing Blizzard universe and IP. They spent two weeks trying to make a new MMO IP entirely that wasn't Titan or anything to do with Blizzard's existing titles. And on the side in kind of the remaining two weeks, there was this idea of this bright and hopeful world where from a lot of Arnold Sang's concept art from Project Titan, put together with Jeff Goodman, who used to work on World of Warcraft, boss battles, encounters. He had a lot of cool hero and class ideas. And together, they were put together as this new kind of seed from which Overwatch came from. Ben Zhang did this cool piece of concept art that was put together, and a lot of people actually speculated this recently to do with the whole Ancora and Orisa stuff as being perhaps a new hero. Jeff actually, in his talk to a bunch of games industry people, specifically called out the subreddit saying, that character is not who you think it is, which is pretty cool. There are other things that came from this talk that I thought were really cool about Overwatch's level and world design. And Jeff mentioned that the team keep asking themselves what's cool about Earth. They learned a lot from World of Warcraft. Jeff used to work on World of Warcraft level design and quest design. And he mentioned the human starting zone. So if you go from the human alliance starting zone, Elmwyn Forest, which is kind of light, into Duskwood, which is kind of dark, you're in an area where there's a lot of variation. The team, however, also learned positive lessons from maybe mistakes that the World of Warcraft and other Blizzard teams had made. And he cited the Burning Crusade as an expansion. If you haven't played World of Warcraft, to summarize this, the Burning Crusade is a really key part of the World of Warcraft story that's been cited in games going back to Warcraft in the late 90s. 
communities. So it's a really big story for the team to tell. It was an important expansion, but it was all very, very dark. The levels were very dark and Blizzard learned that people felt that these dark worlds and places were oppressive, so oppressive in fact, that players were going back to the lighter, older areas to try and spend their time and hang out. Now, if you want people to spend hundreds and thousands of hours in a game, then you don't want to be forcing people out of the new worlds that you're creating. And this very much affected Overwatch world building, which I found very interesting. As a World of Warcraft player myself, I found these areas when I played them very dark. I didn't want to stay in them for too long. The positive thing that the Blizzard team drew from that was looking at Overwatch worlds as where on earth would you like to go and what's cool about Earth? So they picked a lot of holiday places and cool looking destinations. Ilios was pretty much born out of the thought that Jeff kind of liked the look of Santorini himself. Iraq, they wanted a hopeful future. In all games, Iraq and the Middle East have kind of been bombed, war-torn, and they wanted to show a different side of the coin for Iraq, and that's what Oasis was. And the theme of places you've never been but would love to spend some time permeated level design. Jeff also mentioned about how fantasy can be greater than reality, tapping into players' imaginations, and that players can actually imagine things greater than devs can build them sometimes. Now, Jeff actually cited the Hollywood level as an example. The map and world design team at Blizzard for Overwatch contains a lot of people from Europe, for example, and a lot of these people had never been to Hollywood. They designed this level of Hollywood. The team were then actually sent on a day trip to a back lot in Hollywood and around Hollywood, do a little bit of real world fact finding for a bit of context. They actually came back to the studio and said, we got it all wrong. They redesigned it. Jeff and the team then looked at the redesigned one and thought that they didn't actually like it so much. They preferred the Hollywood from the imagination of a person from Belgium or Sweden rather than the realistic portrayal. Now I've been to Hollywood and bits of it um, and I can certainly tell you that parts of it are kind of like you'd see in any other city or town. You know, they're, they're, it's got its grimy bits as well. So this concept of Overwatch having fantasy or improved or idealized versions of Earth and the world that we know while still being relatable, um, sometimes the team preferred these rather than the actual realism side of things. There's another really cool fact about Dorado that came up. Dorado was an important location. It was going to be in Hero, going to be just with Sombra. There were loads of reasons why this location was pretty important. They had a look at different themes for Mexican cities, but they found that Mexico City and several other places looked on the surface as a look what you'd see in other cities around the world. So they wanted something that was differentiating. They started looking at research for sort of coastal stuff because they wanted an edge to the map for gameplay reasons and they also wanted a lot of colour. Now if you type in colourful Mexican town on Google image search you'll see various images come up and this one might be familiar. What was really funny about this that Jeff said was that this is actually Manarola, Italy and that someone only mentioned this to the team when they had got part way through building Dorado. So Jeff then made a joke that any Italian map is clearly going to have to be based off a Mexican city to make up for it. There you go, there's some cool bits about Overwatch's storytelling, background of the game's development and more. Uh, for my sources, the Jeff talk you can actually see on IGN's YouTube channel, I believe. Michael Chu's, I grabbed three different written sources. One was an InVen article from someone who was present at the talk. The Ivory Tower Crumbles over on Tumblr, who was also present at the talk. And finally, a viewer of the channel who was also present, he sent in his notes. A big thanks to you, sir, for giving me a hand with that. Finally, let's wrap up with a few other bits of news and lore tip bits from the last few days. Well, Bastion has been confirmed as genderless, although I think a lot of us probably assume that anyway. His comic binary, that actually takes place after reflections in the timeline, so it's pretty much present day. Now, it's worth pointing out that on the Overwatch news blog that released this comic, it mentioned that it was shortly after the fall of Overwatch. So that little correction by Michael Chu means that Torb's in-game lines disliking Omnix are certainly up to date up until this comic. So who knows, maybe we'll see his voice lines change from now on. Maybe he'll have some interactions with Bastion as the two roam around the world, getting up to their hijinks and tricks. Symmetra was also confirmed again as being on the autistic spectrum. This was actually confirmed for you lore fans, or if you've watched this channel for a while, pretty much quite a long time ago, back in 2016, by one of the writers of the comic on Twitter. If you want to check out a review of that Symmetra comic and where it all came from, have a look at my Symmetra comic analysis below. I've done this for all the Overwatch comics. Gameplay-wise, well, Anna's nerf, where she had a big bat taken to her damage and also her healing throughput, has been part rescinded as the grenade damage and healing has been rolled back a bit on the PTR. I'm not a great Anna. I enjoy playing with her a lot. I can feel effective and live with this change without shelling loads of the biotic rifle damage out. It feels fun in PTR, but let's see where that goes. Zen's Discord through barriers has also been removed. That was on the PTR for a while. I find that quite interesting. Maybe Blizzard are finding that barriers like Arisa's barrier, Reinhardt's barrier, are being shredded enough. But let's see what happens in gameplay when Arisa and these changes hit live. Sombra's health packs will show through PTR walls to her teammates and Genji's ghost blade, where his swings very occasionally register as a hit but don't deal damage, is also on the table to be fixed with no ETA. So for those of you wondering about things like next seasonal event, other things like that, remember that with Arisa's launch and all of this tinkering, there's actually a lot of work going on from the dev team tuning the game's balance under the hood. Really good stuff. 
Last but not least, character bios and lore are actually going to be coming to the game sometime soon, in pieces. On the official boards not too long ago, Michael Chu mentioned that this is being worked on, they've got different ideas, and you'll probably see little bits of it coming a bit at a time in future patches. They would love us to get most of this info in the game, so they're going for it. That's a nice reaction to an oft cited thing that a lot of people have mentioned. Big thanks for tuning in to this Overwatch News Roundup. I hope you've discovered some new things and enjoyed bits of the wider community you might not run into in your daily YouTube or news travels. Throw a like or a sub if you enjoyed, it really helps me out, and let me know what you think of the Overwatch team's few new little facts and interesting background into character, story, and hero creation. Do let me know in the comments. If you're new to the channel, check out all of my regular Overwatch lore videos. You can click these playlists and videos here, whether you're on mobile or on desktop now, and sub if you'd like to see more. Cheers for tuning in. I've been Hammy. Take it easy.